Good morning, friends. Not long ago in a Sunday morning service, we covered Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, where Jesus asked the disciples who they think he is, and Peter gives that famous and thankfully spot-on reply that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And after confirming that Peter is correct, Jesus then tells the disciples not to tell anyone that he's the Christ. And we talked about why Jesus would give such a command, uh, which involved where Jesus was at in that at that particular point in his ministry. Because at that point, if the disciples started going around declaring Jesus to be the Christ, the people, the population of Israel, would probably have gotten the wrong idea about what Jesus actually came to do. Because they would insert their own thoughts, their own conception of what the Christ was, just like Peter tried to do. And that would stoke the fires of a political and military rebellion against Rome uh, when Jesus actually came to defeat sin itself and provided freedom from sin rather than freedom from a physical earthly foe. And so that's why Jesus told them not to go around saying anything explicit about him being the Messiah, at least at that particular time. And now, having come to Matthew 17, we see that directly following the event of Christ's transfiguration, Jesus gives a similar warning, but he clarifies one aspect of it. He commands them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Now, one thing to note before we dive into the meat of this today is that in the first part where Jesus says, tell no one the vision, that's probably not the best translation we could have. Because calling what happened a vision might seem to indicate that what the disciples saw didn't actually happen that it was just a, vi a vision they, that they had in some, some trance or that they never actually woke up. But the way Matthew describes everything as a as an objective narrator, which means he isn't simply giving us the story from the disciples' perspective, we're not seeing things through their eyes, but rather he's telling us what actually happened. Matthew does indeed describe all these things as actually literally physically happening then and there on that mountaintop. And so probably the best way to translate this first phrase from Jesus, um, which is a perfectly legitimate translation, you don't have to do any linguistic gymnastics to make it work, um, you know, but it, it fits the context better and it's a legitimate translation, is to simply see that Jesus is saying, tell no one what you saw until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And that may seem to be a distinction without a difference, but there really is a difference that the disciples genuinely saw Jesus shining with his rightful majesty and glory. It actually happened, and they really did see Moses and Elijah standing there on that mountain next to Jesus. It wasn't, you know, some bizarre out-of-body experience, some intangible vision or dream or whatever else. It, it really did happen then and there um, on, on that mountain. But anyway, Jesus goes on to say, don't tell anyone until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And this just reinforces our explanation from before. Prior to Christ's betrayal and death, prior to his being handed over into the custody of the Jewish ruling council and then to the Roman authorities, prior to all that, any talk of his messiahship would most certainly have been misunderstood and ended up generating that oh-so-misdirected effort to make Jesus a political and earthly or merely national savior rather than an ultimate uh, savior uh, of man from for eternal life by reconciling them to God the Father. But if the disciples wait until after Jesus is betrayed, arrested, crucified, and risen from the dead, then that changes the landscape of the situation entirely. At that point, it can be clearly demonstrated in a this-is-what-already-happened sort of way that Jesus came to be far more than just that earthly-type Savior, that he came to save people from the consequences of their sin, that he came to take the iniquity of God's people on himself, to be crushed by God on account of that sin, which would, would at that point be dem uh, you know, demonstrated Demonstrate, uh, demonstrable, forgive me, um, by what happened on the cross, and that he was raised again from the dead, not to be abandoned to the grave, uh, but to rise again to new life, and then grant that that same glorious life to all who would trust in him for it. And so, really, we have two issues that come to us for uh, for application today. Once again, we have the reminder of asking ourselves what kind of Messiah we want or sometimes even demand that Jesus be. If we are simply looking for Jesus to be a savior who will give us our best life now, if we simply look at him to be our wish fulfillment on this earth, then we're making the same mistake that the Jewish folks did back then. Because that's not what Jesus came to be. He did not come to, to bring us absolute health and prosperity and complete freedom from suffering on this earth. Much to the contrary, he promises us that whoever follows him will have troubles on this earth. And that because there 
they're doing the right things rather than the wrong things. So when, when things go bad for us, it doesn't mean that we've done something wrong or that we lack faith or whatever else is just part and parcel of being a Christian, a follower of Christ. You know, we know that as Christians, we must learn how to be content, whether we are in a season of plenty or of want, whether we are at a low point or a high point in our earthly lives. And we can be content regardless of the situation when we rely fully on the strength of Christ who works within us. Because does God promise us ultimate success, health, prosperity, and joy? He does. But those ultimate promises relate to the fulfillment of his kingdom. The wicked will fade like the grass, but God's people will shine like the sun. We will enjoy that that perfect victory. But that promise relates to the final and full coming of God's kingdom, not necessarily our day-to-day lives here on this earth. Uh, at least not in the fullness of of the promise. And so we must be very careful that we don't look at Jesus as simply that sort of Christ. Because if we come to him and have faith in him for those purposes, just fix my problems now, make my life better now. Well, if that's the sum and total of our faith in him, I'm not sure that's a saving faith to begin with. Because we need to come to Jesus repentant over our sin and trust in him, believe in him, relying on him for our eternal salvation. That we would be reconciled to God the Father through the blood of Jesus, trusting that Jesus has borne the wrath of God against sin so that we don't have to because we never could anyway, leastwise without without spending eternity into hell. And so we trust in him, we submit to him as Lord, which which means submitting ourselves to him as the supreme authority and master of our lives in full reliance upon his ability to save us rather than anything that we can do ourselves. Because that's the kind of Messiah he actually came to be, one that would reconcile sinful people to a holy father God, thereby bringing to those people abundant eternal life through faith in him. The second thing that immediately comes out of this is the command itself and the timeline that it assumes. Because Jesus tells the three disciples who witness his transfiguration not to tell anyone about it, not even the other disciples, until after he's been raised from the dead. Which obviously implies that after the resurrection, they should tell people about it, which they of course did. Which brings us then to the question, which which side of the cross are we on? Are we positioned like the three disciples at the transfiguration? Are we positioned before the cross? Such as the command not to tell anyone about Jesus explicitly being the Christ should be considered you know, in play for us? Well, of course not. Obviously not. Therefore, this is just another reminder that our job is to tell people that Jesus is the Christ. Because obviously the command changed after the resurrection. Says so that Jesus commanded his disciples, which does include you and me, to be witnesses to him. Pointing people to him and the fact that he is the Messiah. That we should make more disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that Christ commanded. So in a sense... There's nothing new today, nothing novel today, nothing that we haven't heard before, but still incredibly important reminders. What kind of Messiah are you looking for? Make sure you're submitting to Jesus as the right kind of Messiah, as the Messiah he actually came to be. And as you share the gospel message about him as Messiah, be aware that people might are going to have or, you know, have those other demands and expectations of him as well. So make sure you're very clear as to what kind of Messiah Jesus came to be and what kind of salvation he came to offer people because he came to save people from the wrath of God against their sin, not simply to fix their worldly problems now. And then, of course, just the baseline idea that we should be sharing the gospel because the Lord is risen. We need to let people know to explain why Christ being risen means something. We need to explain the problem of sin and then point them to the only solution, which is Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, who is the Messiah. And of course, do it in love. Tell them, I love you. I do not want to see you remain under condemnation, but to receive life. Because I really don't believe there's any more loving action we can take than that. And it's with that thought in mind that I pray you have a good and godly day. And Lord willing, I'll see you soon.